Welcome to another episode of Biotherapy Live. This is another very special episode because our guest today is Professor Nigam uh, from the Biomedical Sciences Department at Swansea University. She is also a fellow of the Higher Education Academy where she leads um, she leads the faculty anatomy and physiology team and lectures to a wide range of health professionals, including nurses and paramedics. Dr. Nigam graduated from King's College in London, a very fine um, uh, academic institution, and was subsequently awarded a master's degree in applied parasitology and medical entomology for, uh, from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, uh, one of the two most renowned tropical medicine programs in the world, I would say. <laughs> Dr. Nickham's research career began with investigations of the immune system of insects and other invertebrates. And after successful completion of her doctorate at Swansea University, she researched immune defenses of Chagas disease vectors uh, at the Fundaco Oswaldo Cruz in Rio de Janeiro. In 2001, she established the Swansea University Maggot Research Group, which focuses on the medicinal maggot Lucilia sericata and the molecules involved in larval therapy. She and her team have published widely on the antimicrobial activity of larval secretions and on the wound healing properties of maggots. The team has identified a new antimicrobial factor, for example, uh, serotisin. And Dr. Nig Nigam has also uh, begun and is currently leading a project that investigates public understanding and perception of the clinical use of maggots on wounds. Professor Nigam has been featured in numerous media, radio, TV uh, reports and interviews, and even assisted in several episodes of the BBC medical drama, Casualty. She's a valuable member of the Welsh Wound Network Group and multiple other medical natural science and entomology professional organizations. She has many awards to her name, including the National WISE Award for Innovation, presented by HRH, the Princess Royal in 2018. And she was selected as one of the WISE 20 women in 2020. Many other awards and commendations, too many to mention here because I need to save the rest of the time for Professor Nigam because she has much to teach us and we have much to learn. So without further delay, uh, please share with us some of your experience, wisdom, and uh, a bit on what your activities are these days. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, it's a huge pleasure to be here. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be uh, invited to do this talk. I'm going to share my screen now with you. Hopefully that will all work out. And that's great. That's all. And hopefully you can see it. Albert, is that all good? Yes, yes, everything's good. I can see everything. Thank you. Right. So I'll begin. Um, the talk that I'm going to um, try and give you today in, a, in about 40, 40 minute long, I'm going to try and get through everything that I want to tell you, um, is called For the Love of a Good Maggot. I will start by telling you that as a tiny girl, I loved insects. It didn't matter what insects they were. Uh, it didn't matter what they did. I was fascinated by them. I wanted to look at them, to watch them, to learn about them. And so when I grew up, I took all the entomology courses that I could um, at King's and um, I started to investigate detail about 
the immune, the immune system of insects and how they themselves protected themselves against microbes, pathogens and infections. So I looked at the mosquito, I looked at the regivid bugs, which you've already heard about. And it, it, it struck me that most of the insects that I was looking at were bad and they were doing bad things to humanity. They weren't particularly nice. And of course, most people tear their hair out when you talk about insects. They're not well liked. And it wasn't until when I got to Sonsi University and I was actually awarded after, after my doctorate and postdoc, I was awarded a lectureship in the School of Nursing um, and School of Health Science. And there they asked me to teach about wound care. And it was in 1997 when I started investigating uh, what sort of management strategies we had in the UK for wound care. And I came across something then called larval therapy for chronic wounds. And of course, I became really interested in that being an entomologist. So I thought, right. What is going on here? Why and how are larvae being used for wound management? So what exactly was maggot therapy? Well, we all know it's a clinical application of living, growing larval stages of the green bottle fly, Lucilia sericata, the most commonly used clinical species. We can't use any old species, as we all well know. Here is a mother with one of her little babies. But the larvae of this fly are known as medicinal maggots. We know that ancient tribes and cultures used them. We know that in America, they were also widely used in the 30s, um, early 30s. And then of course, along came antibiotics and that saw the de decline of maggot therapy by the end of the 40s. However, only four years after mass production of antibiotics, we, we saw the first penicillin resistant bacteria. And of course that story now has come to light and we know that there's a huge deal, a huge global catastrophe of antimicrobial resistance looming for us. So because of that, and because of other reasons, we've seen the re-emergence of maggot therapy. There is a renewed interest in maggot therapy. It has seen approval by many governments worldwide, including the FDA and the States and in the UK it's actually now available on NHS prescription since 2004. So we know that worldwide there's, uh, there's availability of sterile commercial grade larvae used for the debridement and cleansing of infected necrotic chronic wounds. We have free range maggots. Many countries still apply maggots, um, loose, loose maggots. In the UK now, I don't believe the company sell these anymore. They've gone directly for the bagged method and I'm sure you know all about that. But the question here is how do we know that maggot therapy is effective? What evidence do we have? Well, we have clinical evidence, including the gold standard randomized control trials, but we also have accumulating scientific evidence. So what is the scientific evidence behind maggot therapy? Here's our head scientist, of course, the great uh, Boris Johnson. Well, in the last two decades, scientists worldwide have been analyzing the bioactivity in maggot secretions. And that's been the focus of my own uh, maggot research group in Swansea and we've spent since 1998 till the present day researching the molecules of, of the Lucilia sericata fly and the maggot. So I'm going to quickly summarize the science, the updated science that we have right now on the three main actions of maggot therapy. What are the three main actions? Well, classically, they're considered to be wound debridement, wound disinfection and wound healing. So I'm going to very quickly summarize what we know about the science of, of each of those. Let's begin with wound debridement. Well, if you are a teeny tiny little maggot that's just emerged from your egg, you're starving and you need to feed and you need to feed very, very fast and very, very quickly to molt a couple of times and become these lovely fat L3 larval stages, at which time, at which point your larval growth will stop and you're free to pupate, turn into this pupa, and then from there, the adult fly will emerge. And you want to do that very, very quickly. Why? Because if you're a juicy fat maggot, you are a victim of many, many creatures that love to eat you. So it's in your best interest to speed up your eating of the, 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 the tissue that you're sitting in and to quickly become the next stage. When you're an adult fly, of course, you can escape predation and not everybody wants to eat a hairy, um, a spiky morsel of a fly. Most people would prefer, the, most uh, people, most animals prefer the juicy, the juicy maggot. So if you are a medicinal maggot and you see this infected chronic wound, 
What you really see is this, a delicious meal for you. So, and we know that the larvae of Lucilla sericata feed very rapidly and exclusively on dead tissue. But they have no teeth. So how do they do that? They can't feed by chomping flesh. Contrary to what a lot of people think, they actually secrete a digestive juice and that comes out from, they secrete that, that comes out to the dead tissue, they turn that dead tissue into a soup and they can slurp it up. What exactly is in this juice? What is the science telling us? Well, we know that maggots produce a powerful array of enzymes for the, for the digestion of their food, or in this case, the wound. And it, they produce a lot of enzymes, these chemical scissors, a cocktail of proteases, which snip bonds between, between this tissue, between the protein of this tissue. Clearly, two main enzymes we know have been identified here as being crucial, and they are the chymotrypsin and the trypsin. And this was the work of David Pritchard's group, and he identified that these two enzymes allow rapid and efficient degradation of necrotic tissue. And in my lab here, we set up liver for our maggots, and you can see this lovely frothy secretion, which is, contains these powerful enzymes, which is going to digest that tissue really remarkably well. And also recently, in 2016, a new larval protease was discovered. Um, the group of Popol discovered this protease that they've call, called Jonah M in maggot secretions. They have found that it's a key enzyme in wound deprivement. It works best at the pH 8, which is the pH of the maggot secretions, and at human body temperature. So it digests many extracellular matrix proteins. Um, and so we know that debridement, for debridement, larvae, larvae possess several different enzymes that play this vital role. How quickly do larvae debride? Look at this very quick case study. Some Japanese surgeons have published this recently. 78-year-old man with critical limb ischemia. He had ulcers all over his right foot. You can see one there. You can see them along his toes. So the surgical team decided to carry out a transmetatarsal amputation. They took off all his toes, including all the ulcers. And that was fine. But then that wound where his toes were dehissed and became infected two months later. So he had a chronic infection going on here. Bear in mind that he's got critical limb ischemia, so the circulation is very poor for him and, and healing is very, very difficult. And luckily one of the, so he was scheduled for further amputation, but luckily one of the surgical team suggested maggots and they tried maggots. They asked him and he said, okay, and they put them on free range, you can see them there. And look at this, two days after the initial maggot placement, where's your infection? Where's the necrotic tissue? It's gone. Where's the, the, the wound has been completely debrided and cleared? How fast did they do that? And, and, and thankfully that wound, that, that foot was saved and that went on to heal two and a half months later. So we know that wound debridement by maggots, by larvae is very, very well established. And that in fact is the, the main reason for using um, larvae. It's called MDT. In some countries, it's called um, maggot debridement therapy or larval debridement therapy. We know that. Well, what about the second action, wound disinfection? This is a severely infected chronic wound. How and what can maggots do about that? Clearly, by debriding that wound, they will be eliminating some of that, um, th that, that uh, bacterial infection. But is there anything else that maggots do? We looked at the secretions. We collected them in a test tube. You can see them being given off as the maggots just squirm around this secretion comes across, we collected it, we pulled it in an Eppendorf tube and we tested it against a range of bacteria and we found that it flatlined several species including MRSA and we went on to discover that it was the tiny, tiny molecule within a fraction of maggot secretions that was doing the killing and we've identified this small antibacterial compound, we've trademarked it as seratocin and we sent some of this to San Diego where they wanted to investigate how it worked on, um, on bacteria. They looked at E. coli and they discovered that our ceratocin extract saw, showed profound elongation of bacteria at just 10%. So that strongly inhibited cell division and septal formation within bacteria, so they couldn't grow. And actually at 50%, it completely lies the cells. So the group in San Diego were quite excited and let us know that this ceratocin maggot isolate has a remarkable effect on bacteria cell wall and cell division. 
But what about other antimicrobial research? Several groups have confirmed the presence of antibacterial peptides against both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And indeed, in 2010, a new antibacterial peptide, lucifensin, was discovered. But even more recently, the German Poppel group have shown that maggots possess the genes which encode for 47 different antimicrobial peptides. And in fact, they've made 23 of them already. So it's apparent that maggots possess the ability to make several different antibacterial and antimicrobial factors. What about other antibacterial properties? What about bacterial biofilm? We know biofilm is notoriously difficult to treat if it gets uh, if it forms in a wound. It's very, very hard to eradicate. Antibiotics don't touch it. Our own body's immune system cannot get rid of it. But we see it a lot in wounds and in wound infections. Um, it, it's this shiny sheen that you get and you know that the wound has a biofilm and it's not uh, going to be very easily treatable. Well, do maggots have any effect on bacterial biofilm? Well, yes, they do. We've discovered that our maggot secretions can destroy preformed biofilms, but moreover, they can also prevent biofilms from forming in the, in the plates that we tried to get biofilm to form that had maggot secretions. Recently, David Pritchard's group in Nottingham discovered a DNAs, an enzyme that destroys DNA that's produced and secreted by larvae. And he, he showed that if you have Pseudomonas arginosa biofilm here with untreated in an untreated situation, and then you added larval secretions, they couldn't form the biofilm very well. And if you added the DNAs, you couldn't get anything. You wouldn't even get the, the bacteria. So you, it's a superb um, a, a series of experiments which shows that maggots contain this enzyme that can stop DNA, uh, stop um, biofilm from forming. And then the Dutch group of Gwendolyn Kazander grew pseudomonas on biofilm surfaces such as, um, sorry, on surfaces such as polyethylene and titanium, materials that are used for catheters and prosthesis and so on. And she found a 92% reduction in biofilm formation just by incubating these materials with maggot secretions. Um, and, and again, Further research recently in 2019 has isolated an extract from larvae, which has been found to prevent biofilm form formation of a couple of species and also eradicate preformed biofilm of these species. So we have evidence of biofilm activity, anti-biofilm activity. What about maggot antifungal activity? Now, you don't tend to get too many fungal infections in wounds, but we just wanted to investigate to see if there was an antifungal factor present. And we found that there was one present. Again, it's a small molecule. We tested it against candida. Here's a control growth of candida. Here's candida with our maggot secretions. And you can see very few colonies here now. But in the presence of the isolated stratifungin, which is the antifungal factor, that's small molecule that we've isolated, we got nothing, we got nothing growing. And we also looked at spore germination of various species and found that the maggot antifungal factor inhibits spore germination. Other groups have also studied it um, and a new um, antifungal agent called leucomycin, it's a novel antifungal peptide, has also been found by other groups um, which has activity against various fungi. So to summarize the maggot antimicrobial research, we know we have antibacterial factors against planktonic bacteria. We have antibiofilm factors against this notorious biofilm that some species of bacteria can form. And we have antifungal factors. And it's all very well isolating these factors. But if you put real living larvae on a wound, you've got all of that going on. It's act, they act like little factories producing all of these antimicrobial molecules as and when they need to. And we've discovered that these, some of these molecules are inducible. They will, maggots will up their game and produce more factors when they need to, if they're surrounded by a particular infection. And what about wound healing? We know that fibroblasts are critical cells to help wounds heal. They're good cells. We want them to arrive at the wound bed once the wound has been debrided and disinfected. 
They're very important, they secrete the new tissue. So they secrete the elastin and the collagen that we know will form that, that wound bed again, the healthy wound bed. Scientifically, what do we know about maggots? Right, we know maggot secretions promote fibroblast proliferation. We've seen that uh, groups have shown that they increase in number. We've also had groups showing us that maggot secretions promote fibroblast migration into the wound bed. And I've got a very quick video clip to show you this from uh, the Nottingham group who published this recently. Let me show you. By contrasting the action of the fluid secreted by the maggots on human fibroblasts, a key cell in the healing process, with the performance of fibroblasts without enzymes, they discovered that the healing process was considerably accelerated. Using time-lapse photography, the impact of the secreted enzymes on the healing process is dramatically illustrated with the fibroblast cells on the right growing together much more quickly than those without the maggot secretions. So that was very interesting when he showed that. And he, he of course, said that Dira Pritchard thought that it was an enzymatic action. And we've been investigating that. And I think it is partly an enzymatic um, uh, an, a, a phenomenon. However, in addition to enzymes, maggots secrete other things. And we've detected some amino acids, three in particular, that are very useful for wound um, healing. And these were the three, valinol, GPA, and histidine. But it doesn't really matter what they were. We've published on that. And, and, and you can see that um, if you want to find that paper. But we did find that all three amino acids to varying degrees stimulated the proliferation of human um, uh, vascular endothelial cells, which are primitive endothelial cells, which will um, proliferate. And proliferation of blood vessel cells can stimulate new blood capillary formation in a process called angiogenesis, which we know is vital for healthy healing wounds so that oxygen can be brought to the newly developing and growing tissue. So um, by, uh, by increasing the proliferation of these cells, it's possible that putting maggots on a wound allows more oxygen to get to the wound via the creation of these, um, of these capillaries. Angiogenesis begins with the proliferation of endothelial cells. And uh, a group in 2016 showed that when they incubated endothelial cells with maggot secretions, they showed a significantly higher formation of capillary tubes. And they're the tubes that we know will be formed to carry the oxygen that will give rise to new tissue. And in addition, so many other groups, and I've just quickly got three things to tell you on this. Zhang et al. looked at a very important pro-angiogenic molecule, which is a microRNA molecule. Basically, he showed that levels of this molecule increased and were significantly higher following treatment with maggots than before the, the patients had been treated with maggots. And then another group looked at a clinical wound healing study in 39 patients with critical limb ischemia who'd already undergone midfoot amputation and they had non-healing wounds. These guys separated out the groups into a maggot debridement therapy group and a control group, and they showed there was 86% of wound healing in the maggot debridement group compared to 38% in the control group. Another group looked at a similar pro-angiogenic microRNA molecule and basically just showed that transcription of this molecule was upregulated in the wound tissue of patients if they had had treatment with maggot therapy. So we've got a, a nice um, escalating amount of evidence that's coming forward about how maggots are actually affecting key biochemical pathways in the wound healing process. And then we had a systemic, systematic review in 2020 which concluded that maggot therapy facilitated faster and more effective debridement of non-viable tissue. It enabled faster development of granulation tissue, which we know is the healthy tissue that we want to see in a wound, and increased reduction in the wound surface area compared to, to the control dressings. And our group also has recently identified that maggot secretions have homology to various human growth factors and including transforming growth factor beta uh, and other important wound healing factors. And we've published this work in 2019. So there is there is something going on within the maggots that's allowing wounds to heal a little bit better. Even more recently, some Polish researchers examined wound healing rates following the application of Lucilia sericata, and they showed that the density of maggots that you put on a wound accelerates the rate of the wound to heal. They found that by doubling the application of maggots, that increased the healing rate by over 20%. 
And limb salvage, we know there is increasing published evidence to suggest that maggot debridement therapy can prevent amputation. And a lovely study, which I think Ron Sherman was part of, was with 28 patients with chronic wounds on lower limbs. 13 of those limbs were considered unsalvageable and were scheduled for amputation. But when all the wounds were treated with maggots, the wounds became completely clean and free of infection and all the limbs were saved. And even more recently, a report in January last year from Nigeria, where they've started in a particular teaching hospital to introduce some doctors have begun to treat chronic wounds um, of patients who have diabetes. They have reported that in six months, they have saved 30 amputations. And, and there's the detail of that report if, if you wanted to read it. So there is escalating abundant clinical and scientific evidence which highlights the effectiveness of maggot therapy. We can see that it works and we can show how it works. So wouldn't we therefore expect a high patient and practitioner acceptance? Well, in 2014, one of my grants that I had applied for to do further science on the wound healing factors by the Medical Research Council was rejected. And it was rejected, which was fine. I get grants rejected all the time. But the, one of the reviewers had complained that whilst the science we put forward was all well and good, no one wants to use maggots, is what this reviewer said. And that's the reason that they had rejected the, the work that I was trying to do. So I thought about it and I thought, yes, of course, I've heard of the Yelp Factor. Everyone has. People write about it all the time. But I really wanted to know, is there really a hurdle against the mainstream acceptance of maggot therapy? I felt that we needed to survey that. We needed to find out whether that was true. So indeed, we carried out those surveys. We carried out a survey from Swans University where we asked lots and lots and lots of people on, on an online survey. And I also got um, an independent polling company called Opinion to do some surveys for us as well. So let's have a look at some of these participant responses. This was a question to how aware uh, the public, the public this is not patients, just general public, are aware of the following non-surgical treatments. And if we look here, it was honey, maggot therapy, hydrosurgery and enzymatic, we found an awareness it's quite high in the general population. Half of the population knew that maggots could be used for chronic wounds, whereas the other things were actually lower, even honey was lower. But then we asked, how acceptable do you find these treatments? And look again, maggot therapy was lower in acceptance than all the other types of treatments. And more importantly, 30, almost 31% of people thought it was actually an unacceptable treatment for chronic wounds. So we dug a little bit deeper and we asked questions and 20% of, of people said that they were worried about turning into flies, 25% associated maggots with death, uh, and you can see some people thought it made the meal, and about 41% thought that it made their, the thought of maggot therapy made their skin crawl. So we decided to look at the open-ended responses. We asked them, were there any positive responses? And the positives were a few. You'd be mad not to take this chance of this therapy. It works. Other people said, I would have no problems trying the treatment. Should it be recommended by a health professional? And that comes up over and over again, that if a doctor or a nurse says that this is what you will have, they will accept it. OK, so that's important. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. And some people just thought it was an excellent form of treatment. But we also got some negative responses and they the open end responses were things like I worry that I wouldn't be able to get past the idea of bugs running about all over me eating my flesh. Well, that doesn't really happen. But anyway, I worried that they could somehow get inside me. We know Lucilla sericata is non-invasive. It's one of the few species that is non-invasive. So even though it's contraindicated around orifices, we do not believe that it's an invasive uh, maggot. Um, Someone else said, I can fully see the benefits of maggot therapy, but the thought is terrifying. And there was the worry about being stigmatized by others, and that will come up to later as well. Someone said, I love the idea, but I'm somewhat phobic about insects, and I worry I would not cope well. So we thought, right, we need to get out there. We need to start looking and addressing some of these issues. How can we convince people to overcome this disgust or fear or worry that they have? And we thought perhaps 
We need a better communication of knowledge and understanding of the medical benefits of maggot therapy. And that might help improve the public acceptance and might overcome some of these fears. So we embarked on a campaign of public engagement. And the campaign was called Love a Maggot. And I launched it in 2016 at Swansea University. Uh, we developed this lovely little creature called Matty the Maggot, who was our mascot. And we went on Facebook, and we still are on Facebook as Love a Maggot. We went on Twitter as Love a Maggot. And I developed a website www.loveamaggot.com which is open and free for everybody to use and it's got full it's full of news about maggot therapy and the background of maggot therapy and so on and so on um, and on youtube we created a couple of videos um, a couple of animations the wonderful world of medicinal maggots and medicinal baby maggots and their uses and they're available free to watch and look at as well so we started kickstarted this campaign what was the aim of our campaign to address the negative perception of maggots and to share the knowledge and the science of medicinal maggots, hoping that we could increase the acceptability of maggot therapy as a wound treatment. So here I embark on my campaign. I take a leg out to the beach, a wounded leg, and I talk to, to people about it. I bring my maggots along, I show them, I talk to them. We do events in, in science festivals and museums and libraries all over the place. You can see us there. And we always get hordes of people interested in what we're talking about. I have my own team maggot who talk to everybody about um, the wonders of medicinal maggots. We've had beautiful models made of the fly, of the larva. And of course, you can see in the background a pupa that my husband actually made for me that we can actually we can show people when we talk about the life cycle. We've created a, a leaflet that we give out, uh, which details everything you want to know about maggots. And we always have a box of clinical grade maggots that are ready for people we have a we have a station called feel how maggots feel and people put maggots on their hands and they think well actually they're not so bad yeah they're wriggling and they're we can feel them but they're not so bad some people don't like them as you can see some people love them and they're fascinated by them and we often get hordes of people around our our, our maggot station We've set up a maggot racing. Now, the reason of setting up maggot racing was to endear the maggots to people as they run for their lives towards an infected wound. So we've set up the story that maggots are racing towards this infected wound. And, and each person gets a number and they 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 vie for their maggot. And if they you can see the interest, especially with kids cheering on their maggot to get to the infected wound first. And we give them chocolates, those maggot chocolates, people that have actually won that particular um race. My husband is dressed up as a maggot here. He comes along to all events and people love this maggot that wanders around giving out leaflets to people. Of course, we evaluate the hell out of everything we do. And I'm just going to show you a sample of some of our results. Um, evaluated awareness. So before visiting the Love a Maggot event, how many people were aware of maggots? 335 said that they the, oh, so that they weren't aware of it. But of course, after visiting the, the, um, the event, that doubled to 90, that gets to 97.3% of people felt they'd learned some new information about the use of maggots in wounds. What about agreeing to maggot therapy? Well, before the event, 50%, that's quite good. Half of the people we asked said, yeah, I, I'd have it. But look, after the event, that went up to 90%. Now, whether these people could have it or not, who knows? But they felt more comfortable about having maggots on their wound should they need to. And just an example, we get some very, very positive comments from the event evaluation. And I just want to highlight a couple. Excellent, very interesting. I would now consider. So that's positive. Brilliant. Poor maggots having a yuck reputation. And then finally learn very interesting and new information. Interesting to hear about the application of maggots in wound treatments. People, some people didn't know that they were used. And then interestingly, we got a couple of comments, or well, quite a few, about the fact that educating GPs and nurses is important so that the option of maggot treatment can be offered. And somebody said, I don't know anybody who's ever been offered maggot treatment. And if the GPs and nurses advocate it more strongly, patients patients would be more inclined to use it. So we thought, well, how about a survey of nurses? In the UK, wound care is nurse led. Um, yes, GPs might help in deciding whether they're going to say yes or no, but 
tissue viability nurses, district and community nurses are wound specialists. And so they are the ones that will decide whether a patient's wound is suitable for maggot therapy and whether they wish to, to do that. So we, we got the opinions of all sorts of nurses, and I'm just showing you the ones of non-wound specialist nurses. We had a quarter of them roughly saying that it made them feel ill. We had a high percentage saying that they were disgusting and a thought of making this, the thought of maggot therapy made their skin crawl. And even some non-wound specialist nurses thought that maggots would turn into flies on, on, on their patient. But this was interesting, the barriers that non-wound specialist nurses associated with maggot therapy, the main barrier, and they could choose as many as they liked, was this one, lack of confidence. And that I think is very clear that we don't have a situation where we, the, the, the nurses feel confident enough to administer maggot therapy. We took comments from, we, we did a series of interviews with nurses um, and we took comments from both wound specialist nurses and non-wound specialists. So they said, I find that families usually come to a clinic with a relative and sometimes you'll get a bit of negativity from a relative. Some staff, which is uh, fellow nurses, don't like maggots, you know. I've had some staff nurses point blank refuse to have anything to do with them. And other TVNs and, and, and general nurses said, from my experience, you know from the girls that I worked with who would just not do the maggot dressing. Um, and a TVN said, we teach student nurses, I'll always teach them about maggot therapy. And when the slides come up and maggots are actually on a wound, the automatic reaction is disgust. But it's educating. We need to educate qualified nurses who may not have had contact with larval therapy and the work that it does. It's definitely, definitely about education. So we thought, right, let's do some practitioner engagement. So now I go to various district and community nurses sitting together and I do a maggot therapy talk. I've gone to Ireland to do talks with nurses. I teach my undergraduate nurses maggot therapy. They have a hands-on session with me every single cohort. And you can see me here discussing maggots and how valuable they are. And now I've managed to get maggot therapy in the nursing undergrad undergraduate curriculum of all Welsh universities. So of course I do it in Swansea, but I've established recordings and maggot um, ambassadors in Cardiff, in Uber University of South Wales and in Bangor. So hopefully every nurse coming out of Wales will have this knowledge and not be so averse to thinking or trying maggot therapy. And the last thing I'll tell you about quickly is how have we engaged with school children and why have we engaged with school children? Why have I taken Love a Maggot into schools? When you have a tiny little child, they are so curious, so in love with squiggly, wriggly things, and they find them fascinating. They ask questions all about maggots at that age. They love them, they can hold them, they're fascinated by them. When they get a little bit older, they're not so fascinated. They find that they're a bit more disgusting. Look at them, look at the fear in some of these kids. And I wanna know from between the ages of like three and nine, how does that change? Why do children begin to associate maggots with a negative perception? So I've been, in, we get schools coming to visit the university, we go into schools, we teach them, we have stations where we teach them all about the maggots. Uh, again, you can see the props that we use, you can see the um, lover maggot um, uh, brochures, we've got live maggots, we've got uh, key ring maggots, we've got cuddly maggots, we've got all sorts of things that they're interested in, we've got mugs with lover maggot, and of course my chef friend, my lovely chef friend, makes maggot shortbread cookies, which children just love. Um, and they're only allowed to have a cookie if they filled in an evaluation for me. So I get that. We've devised a computer game, which is called Maggots versus Bacteria. Our computer science department have so kindly developed this brilliant game, which is free to play on my loveamaggot.com website. And basically, you have patients who have wounds and you have to save that patient's leg, save that patient by giving antibiotics and then by administering maggots. And you can see kids just absolutely love to play this game, maggots versus bacteria. Um, and then you can save as many patients as you possibly can and you get points for saving all these patients. So we asked school children, well, what do you get out of this? Do you like maggots, for example? Before our, our intervention, did you like maggots? And you can see that, um, 
about half of them, uh, about 25 percent sorry, of them said they like maggots, but more said that they didn't. But after we had done our Love a Maggot event, we found that 60.8 um, percent of school children felt that they actually now quite liked maggots. And more interestingly, the comments that we got um, in terms of what they thought about maggots before the Love a Maggot event, the negative comments far outweighed the positive. But after our event, we found that we got way more positive comments about maggots and the perception of maggots had changed and we did a word cloud we found what word do, do children associate with maggots before the love a maggot event and you can see the prime word was disgusting slimy ugly gross after the love a maggot event this was the major word helpful amazing still a bit of disgust but useful lovely nice and so on so we've got high hopes for maggot engagement in schools and in education with our love a maggot campaign We've told children at the end of it, they take a leaflet home for their parents and grandparents. And as a result, I've been approached by many, many retired groups to come and do my talk, Rotary Groups, Women's Institutes and so on. And there I am talking to the patient, the, the, the public who are more likely to become patients with chronic wounds in, in the near future. And I get called out to do a lot of these. Uh, and people are fascinated with the maggot bag, with the leg. Uh, they are actually physically ha happy to hold them and show off that they're holding the maggots. They, they, they love to be seen with the maggots, all these retired people. And my last thing that I will tell you is finally in 2019, the, pro the, the producers of BBC Casualty got in touch. Now, BBC Casualty is a long running medical emergency drama and it airs prime time on Saturday evenings on BBC One. It's set in an emergency department of a fictional hospital, but each episode, and this is a lot for the UK, has four million viewers. So the producers asked me to come and give a talk, and here I am giving a talk to the scriptwriters and producers of Casualty, and they then made the decision that they were going to include maggot therapy in four episodes of their new series, and I helped them to write various bits and bobs with the script. They chose the best consultant, Dylan, who was fantastic at talking about maggots in wounds and he he set up a colony in the hospital and it was absolutely brilliant the four episodes covered maggot therapy really well and they made their prime time tv debut i the bbc allowed me to interview the actors and ask them how they felt about maggot therapy and that interview is also available on my website and it, and it, and it was uh, very well received by people but i evaluated that what impact did maggots appearing on BBC Casualty have. This is called entertainment education. And I'll just show you very quickly one table. We asked how has, well, we didn't ask, we did an independent survey. How has portrayal of maggot therapy on casualty affected your perception? And we found that we got a much more positive perception, although we also got a lot that were unchanged, um, but it didn't increase their negativity. And then we are, since its appearance on BBC Casualty, do you now feel that maggot therapy is a more acceptable treatment? And we had 63.7% people saying that, yes, it was now a bit more acceptable. So maggots have become national TV stars. And I will end by thanking my team maggot, my research team, lots and lots of people have contributed to the science, to the Love a Maggot campaign, and and I've been funded by Action Medical Research, by the Welsh um, European government, European Union, the Welsh government, Welsh Crucible, many other people, Swansea University, that fund my work. And it just remains for me to moon you all. And thank you very much for listening. And I will end with any questions from you at all. We'll take uh, questions in just a second. I Shall I stop my share, Ron? Shall that I stop it? That would be it? great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, while Albert checks the chat uh, uh, and the uh, Facebook Live page for questions, uh, let me first offer the opportunity to those uh, currently in attendance on the Zoom meeting. Uh, but actually, even before that, I've, I've got to say that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really illuminating and um, uh, inspiring and even exhilarating. Your energy is contagious. Uh, so any questions from... Uh, Thank you, Ron. I think I spoke very fast and I apologize for that. I had too much to say. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, there is one question in the chat. 
from Ms. Uh, Shelly Swen. Uh, can you comment who, who on- is, who, is, who is here? And so if, oh, yeah. <laughs> if you would like to uh, express your question in person, you, you may. Sure. Uh, sure. Can you tell me uh, or can you comment on uh, the difference between free range and uh, maggots that come in bags? Is there a difference in, in the improvement in wounds? We still use free range, but I'm wondering uh, what would be the benefits of using the maggots that come in a bag? Wonderful question. And I can take that and I can simply say that in my experience and all the time that I go out to clinics with nurses, so I don't apply maggots to patients' wounds, but I'm with the nurses when they do it because they're, they're trained to do it. They always tell me that the free range maggots work brilliantly because they have that ability to crawl into in around that wound. Obviously you have to seal it very, very well so that they don't escape and, and with the breathable dressing, but free range work brilliantly, loose maggots. The bag works well too, and it's been designed to make it more acceptable for patients. Now, every time I talk to patients, they say they prefer the bag because the, it's, they're contained. There's no way those maggots are getting out of that bag. And I think that, if you're looking at the psychology of why patients would say no, then I think that that is a really big stride forward in acceptability. Ron, would you agree? Yes, um, and if I may, I'll add a few, a few words. Um, but first, Shelley has quite a bit of experience with maggot therapy, don't you? And if I recall, <laughs> your, 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 uh, we can't hear you, but if I recall correctly, your experience goes, um, uh, must be nearly 20 years. Yes, it, it is. <laughs> I remember in, I think it was 2004, Six, two thousand five. Uh, we were together at a conference, and you were one of the teachers, right? Yes, <laughs> I was. Uh, it was great. Thank you. So uh, Shelley actually has experience training people in free range maggot therapy back in two thousand six at maybe the University yes. of California in Riverside. Yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So my words would be, number one, free range maggots. Um, in, in the studies, the few comparative studies that have been done show more rapid debridement, hands down. Uh, in Dumville's study, uh, debridement was uh, complete on an average of two weeks. And by the way, the wounds were uh, checked weekly. Uh, so by two weeks uh, uh, was the average uh, amount of time for the free range. It took four times longer uh, on average for the uh, bagged maggots to completely debreed those wounds. It took much, much longer for the control therapy. So bag maggots are definitely effective, but they take longer because the, mag the free range maggots, um, as Yamni said, can go everywhere uh, and they do. So I brought that up to the um, uh, patent inventor, Wim Fleischmann, in Germany. Um, uh, and uh, his uh, associate, Volker Olmstede. Uh, and we had a discussion about bags. And they expressed, I'm going to pretty much, as best I can, repeat their words, uh, because I've become a believer um, bagged maggots work better than free range maggots that don't get used. And the fact is some people are uncomfortable with 
free range maggots, more comfortable with bagged maggots. And clearly, uh, it's better to use maggots uh, than, than not to. The pill in the bottle does no good. You have to put it in your mouth in order to get uh, effect. It doesn't matter that you picked up your prescription if you don't use it, that sort of thing. Um, I had one more comment on it. Yes, there are real clinical times when the bag should be used and the free range should not be used. If you were going to treat a wound by an eye, for example, you wouldn't want to even risk a free range maggot getting out of the dressing. Um, maggot therapy in the mouth, you wouldn't do free range maggots, but you could put a bag. Um, I had two cases of um, patients with mouth ulcers. Um, uh, so there are uh, indeed situations where, where um, bags are in fact preferable even if someone is accepting to uh, free range. Okay, sorry. Uh, let's go back to more questions for Dr. Nigam. Thank you. Anything else, Albert? Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Yusuf has his hand raised. Dr. Yusuf, would you like to unmute yourself? Okay, uh, good day to you all. It's, uh, I must say, I, I, I missed most parts of the presentation, but the few parts I got, uh, it's actually well presented. And uh, uh, I, I, I would love to appreciate Dr. Sherman for this opportunity created to always meet people around the world that are into biotherapy. I want to congratulate the presenter for a very good work. I've read the uh, outstretch on what he has been doing on maggot deprivement therapy. Sorry, my name is Dr. Mustafa Ahmad Yusuf. I am talking from, uh, from Nigeria. And uh, recently, I also have been working in the field of maggot deprivement therapy. I was also opportune to be hosted by this great uh, foundation to showcase and to tell the world about what we are also doing about maggot debridement therapy. This last aspect you are talking about the bag, that's the bio bag and the, 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 the free range method is actually very impressive, very interesting. I've also co have a couple of experience with that. I was called at a point in time from the dental surgeons, the dentistry, that they have a patient who had a cavity up there and they feel if maggot debridement therapy could be used. And I suggested to them that, yes, we could use maggot therapy, but not the free range, not the confinement method. We could use the bio bag. We could contain, that's the containment method. We contain the maggot within the bio bag, and then we could use it up there. Also, we've had a cases of uh, where we had to treat necrotizing fasciitis of the perineal area is a very sensitive area also. We also had to use the bio bag. So it's uh, very interesting and I look forward to working and uh, I, I don't know, I, I will try to follow the, the presentation later in the website, but I think I am actually very interested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gordon Jama. Uh, thank you for, for sharing and for joining us. Um, you're doing some really good work. Um, and I hope one of these days we'll be able to have you back on our show again uh, with some updates uh, on, uh, on some of that. Um, if there are no more questions, uh, I, I would like to take this opportunity. Um, and First of all, mention to uh, the audience and all the viewers that a lot of these Love a Maggot programs and campaigns and information can be found on the internet, on uh, YouTube. Uh, in fact, 
uh, there are a couple of very uh, nice uh, videos. Uh, we don't have time for them right here, but maybe we'll put the links uh, in, into the discussion or into the chat uh, for the recorded session uh, of some of these campaigns. Um, I have a question about one of them in which you are holding up um, com little computer screens and, and they tell us very important messages. I, I wish we had time to, uh, to actually show that video. And then you toss it aside and pick up another screen of another message. Uh, anyone watching this, please check it out. The link will be uh, below at some point. It, it's very effective, it's very entertaining, it's very memorable. It made me think of um, Bob Dylan's oh, Dylan, yeah, Bob I Dylan's stole it from Bob Dylan. Homesick yeah. Blues. Yeah. And I've been dying to ask you, was that a part of the inspiration or just something that maybe you thought of later? absolutely inspired by Bob Dylan. I've loved Bob Dylan and I just thought, right, I'm going to do something like that because it is a brilliant way, I think, and a fun way to get a message across. So yeah, I did. I stole it from Bob Dylan. <laughs> um, I thought I thought maybe you stole it from Weird Al Yankovic's um, satire, parody of Bob Dylan. Uh, <laughs> I actually saw a, a Weird Al's version before I saw uh, Bob, Bob Dylan's. Dylan. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. No, I, I didn't say, I don't think I've seen that one, but yes. But thank you for saying that. I'm glad because I, I, we don't get feedback about the videos. I, I, I'm glad that you find it. It's it's interesting and it's informative. That That's great. That's the point, isn't it? So, thank you. Maybe a survey pre and post <laughs> video uh, would go well with your, yeah. your other research. It is 10 o'clock. Well, 10 o'clock local time, six o'clock your time. It is, indeed. So we should wrap it up here. Uh, I thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we learned a lot. We laughed a lot. We enjoyed a lot. I think we are all inspired a lot. And not only those who are in attendance, but those who will certainly come to this video uh, in greater and greater numbers once word gets out. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you all who have joined us and participated uh, today. And if anyone can think of people uh, you would suggest to be interviewed or if you yourselves uh, are ready to sit on that uh, interview chair and tell us about your work uh, by all means. We'd love to learn from you and with you. So anything else, Albert? Uh, there's nothing else in the chat or the uh, Facebook live stream chat. Okay. Well then, goodbye, good night, and thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.